Now, as many of you may know pretty well, some of the greatest leaders in history have come from the most unexpected places. Albert Einstein might be an example who was known to be an average student in Germany, but wouldn't revolutionize science with his theory of relativity. Another example might be Arnold Schwarzenegger, who came from a small village and town in Austria, yet rose to become not only the best bodybuilder in the world, but also a successful actor and later the governor of California. In the world of football, there is Lionel Messi, who grew up in a, a small and humble place in Argentina to be one of the greatest footballers in the history of the sport. And in politics too, there is Abraham Lincoln, who was born in a log cabin in Kentucky and became one of the most influential presidents in American history. What makes these stories inspiring is that greatness can emerge from unexpected places. And these individuals bring hope to those in society who might feel small and insignificant. Uh, I have been fascinated by stories like this since a relatively young age. And one of my favorite movies growing up through my teenage years was actually Rocky where the underdog boxer becomes the heavyweight champion of the world and inspires thousands and thousands of people watching him progress. We are fascinated by stories that speak of triumph and victory despite adversity. And our emotions are stirred as we hear these tales and we learn, we learn also the values of perseverance and humility too as we are reminded that we are often wrong in our judgment of who can be great and who cannot be so great. Now, in these holy scriptures, Bethlehem was a place that represented insignificance. It was a small and unremarkable town near the city of Jerusalem, often overlooked for its small size and lack of prestige. What makes the place so important is that God had planned to do something amazing through this humble location. And that amazing event is nothing other than the birth of a king who would come to rule the world with his might and govern the nations with his infinite power. The king who is our Lord Jesus Christ was indeed born in the humble town of Bethlehem. And from there and out of there, he rose to save the world from their sins and to deliver them from God's judgment and from his internal wrath. God surely does amazing things through amazing people and amazing places. And God does act in ways that we can expect him to act. For example, we pray and he answers our prayers. And so not everything in the way God works for us is completely surprising but he also brings greatness out of small places and he does surprise those who are narrow in their vision. Our God shows that his work will not be confined to our limited vision and our lowly expectations, but he transcends them, he challenges them, and he even breaks them to reveal his utter greatness and to show our smallness. We are reminded over and over again through the teachings of the scripture and through our own experiences that we are nothing but creatures who cannot read fully God's mind. And that's what we learn from this chapter 2, uh, which is uh, chapter 5 from Micah that speaks about that reality. Uh, but before we dive into the fifth chapter of the book today, let me quickly recap the first four chapters to bring to your attention some of the key messages we've looked at thus far. And so Micah was a prophet sent by God to speak to the people of Israel and to the people of Judah during the 8th century BC. And he brought a message of judgment to the people who had turned away from God. Chapters 1 through 3 describe the corruption of the leaders in the impending judgment that would come from God through the surrounding nations. But in chapter 4, the tone shifts to one of hope and joy as Micah prophesied about peace and restoration. 
in chapter 4, verse 3, we hear of the promise of a peaceful future that will dominate the land of Zion. And I think this will be a good starting point for us as we look at chapter 5 today, because we'll continue to think about the theme of peace. And so verse 3, chapter 4, He shall judge between many peoples and rebuke strong nations afar off. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. They will be ruled by God, Micah is simply saying, and they will be governed by God in peace. And so the first point of the fifth chapter that we're looking at today is that a king sent by God will be born. A king will be born in a place called Bethlehem in Judea. And this is a hopeful message for sure, but this is also a sobering message as God keeps his promise through unexpected ways. Again, God will surely fulfill his promise and he will never abandon his precious children. But the way of salvation would not be fully grasped by mere creatures like us. And it is not restricted to human wishes and dreams. And our God is far above our limited capacity. And so the chapter opens with a description of their current distress. And here we read, Now gather yourself in troops, O daughter of troops. He has laid siege against us. They'll strike the judge of Israel with a rod on the cheek. Now, this paints a vivid picture of humiliation for the people of Israel, and especially uh, the leaders of the nation for sure, as they're all under siege by their surrounding enemies, and the cheek of their leader is slapped. You know, in ancient cultures, to be struck on the cheek was a serious insult, just as we would feel insulted if somebody slapped our cheek. It was a sign of weakness because allowing an enemy to strike you means that you are vulnerable and unprepared in defending against the attack. The leaders here were powerless, the judges were clueless, and the people were helpless in the face of the attack. And it shows that God's nation lost their power and glory, and they in turn faced ridicule and scorn from their surrounding enemies. But then in verse 2, the tone changes dramatically, and it says, But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me, the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting. Now, this may be one of the most inspiring verses, I think, in the entire book of Micah. And it is one of the clearest prophecies concerning the gospel salvation in the Old Testament. God announces that the ruler will emerge from this town called Bethlehem, Ephrathah, whose origin reaches back to the ancient days and eternity, basically, because he's from of old, from everlasting. From this small town, God would raise up a governor to bring peace and salvation to the remnants of Israel. And this king is actually the son that Genesis 3.15 talked about. When God said to the serpent, serpent there, I'll put enmity between you, the serpent, and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. The king or the son shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. It is he that God is promising to provide to the people of Israel for their governance and protection. And here we see our God keeping his promise and staying firm to his course in paving a way for the coming of the king and preparing the nation for the gospel of peace. Then verse 3 says, Therefore you shall give them up until the time that she who was in labor has given birth. Then the remnant of his brethren shall return to the children of Israel. 
This clearly speaks of a period of waiting and difficulty for God's people during their suffering and exile, and they would be given up until the time is right for the coming of the promised king. It is like a mother in labor enduring intense pain, but knowing that new life will eventually emerge and come through the process. And this imagery must have helped the people back then to understand that God had not abandoned his people, but was preparing for them the way of deliverance through the king who was to come. And in verses 4 and the first part of verse 5, we read about the specific ministry this king will perform for those under his care. We read, he shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall abide, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and this one shall be peace. Again, notice the image of the king as a shepherd who brings peace and protection in this last part of the prophecy. And this would have been comforting to those familiar with agricultural realities because they would know very clearly that God will feed his flock and protect them from danger, ruling over them in peace just as he feeds them. Unlike the weak leaders, this king will stand strong in the strength of our God. And unlike the greedy leaders who devour the people and stole their belongings, This king will feed and give and provide, and not just for Israel alone, but for the whole world. As it says, he shall be great to the ends of the earth. He shall be great to the ends of the earth. And those of you familiar with the teachings of the New Testament would clearly recognize that this king indeed is our Savior Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter 2, we see the fulfillment of the promise when the wise men came to worship Jesus in that very place called Bethlehem in Judea. The Gospels identify our Lord Jesus as the promised King who came to rescue the people of our God. And also in John's Gospel, we learn that Jesus is the Good Shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep, for their protection and salvation. Jesus, our Lord, is the good shepherd through whom and by whom we are saved. And we are also told that he will rule the entire world. As Revelation says, he will rule the nations with the rod of iron. Jesus will rule the nations with the rod of iron, and he will slap the cheek of God's enemies, as it were, and display his utterly dominant power. Christ is the king that we are blessed with by the grace of our God. And he is the one by whom you are saved and protected even now in this world. Our God sent Jesus to save you, guide you, protect you, and feed you. And he will sustain you in the midst of imperfect leaders who fail to care for you. Unlike any earthly leaders who falter and fail and lose strength so quickly, our Lord Jesus stands as your perfect King, who forever remains unshaken and staunch. He reigns in righteousness and He reigns in peace. Jesus is the King who laid down His life and went to the cross on our behalf. And he secures victory and provides all that you need to be saved and delivered into God's great and holy kingdom. And he gives you new life that you may live forever with him without enemies threatening your life. And so Jesus is the king who shepherds his flock. And you can trust him completely, taking refuge in him. Follow his word. Receive the gospel and submit to his counsel given to you in the Holy Scriptures and believe that you have no other, uh, you have no better leader and king than Christ Jesus our Lord. And live with the conviction that Jesus will not betray you, but he will be with you forever 
to protect you. Jesus is your king. And though he was born in a humble place. So the second theme that we notice now is that enemies will be torn by the king who will be born. Micah continues to describe the power of its king by saying that the Messiah will conquer his enemies, whether spiritual or physical, and is also saying that this king will bring peace, even through warfare, battle, and conquest. And so, beginning with the rest of verse 5, we read, When the Assyrian comes into our land, and when he treads in our palaces, then we'll raise against him seven shepherds and eight princely men. The Assyrian here seems to represent not just the nation of Assyria, but all the hostile powers and forces that threaten God's people. Uh, the singular Assyrian here seems to symbolize a united force attacking the church of our God, and it captures all the enemies of God, much like the great dragon in the book of Revelation, if you remember. And when Micah says, we'll, we'll raise against him uh, here in verse 5, he likely means that God's people will rise up against the dragon, as it were, under the leadership of this promised king. The phrase seven shepherds and eight princely men indicates God's complete provision for their military defense. And seven and eight here are not just literal numbers, but symbolic signs of fullness, the numbers that show that God will equip his people to fight against the enemies. And the passage continues in verse 6, and it says, They shall waste with the sword the land of Assyria and the land of, land of Nimrod at its entrances. Thus he shall deliver us from the Assyrian when he comes into our land, when he treads within our borders. The places Nimrod and Assyria represent the powers that rise up against the kingdom of our God. And when it says he shall deliver us from the Assyrian, it assures us that God's deliverance will come, even when the enemies are at our doorsteps, threatening our lives. Verses 7 to 9 then offer even more encouragement, as they say. Then the remnant of Jacob shall be in the midst of many peoples, like dew from the Lord, like showers on the grass, that tarry for no man or wait for the sons of men. The remnant of God's people is described poetically as dew and showers, which are expressions of blessing given through God. Dew falls gently bringing nourishment to the earth, and showers refresh the land by watering it and renewing it with life and vitality. And then verse 8 expresses that the remnant of Jacob will be like a lion among the beasts and like a lion among flocks of sheep. And it shows the powerful role the remnant will play among the nations of the earth like a lion in the animal world. Just as a lion is feared and dominates its play, prey, so too will the remnant of God's people be strong in their attack. And this doesn't mean that they will be given an opportunity to regain their ego and inflate their self-confidence, but it means that their confidence in God's power it will increase and our God will gl give glory to them despite their smallness. And so, the basic message in this part, I like to say, is that God will tear down the enemies who had stood against His name, and He will do that together with these lowly people who, in, in no way, uh, in any way uh, we can conceive of, who cannot boast in their power, glory, or strength. He will challenge narrow expectations and bring about victory in very surprising ways. And just as our Lord Jesus said, the last will be first and the first last. We are invited to see this prophecy as a promise, but also a mission, as God wants us to be hopeful on the one hand, and also to be humble in acknowledging our small condition. Uh, you can trust in Jesus' power and you can rest in his loving care 
and you can stand firm in the knowledge that he will fight the battle for you. Jesus has good, fought the good fight. He will conquer even more the forces of Satan. And as you know that, and as you believe that to be true, you should join Jesus in fighting sin and standing up for God. Stand firm when you're tempted and persevere when you're discouraged and live out the grace of the gospel by resisting sins that pull you away from Jesus. Go and bear witness to his power and live like the gentle dew and the lion, especially when you face trials. And do not lose heart, but press on, giving glory to God for the strength, giving glory to God the Father for the strength that enables you to fight Satan. So the final theme now then in this chapter is that idols will be gone by the king who would be born, and they'll be destroyed completely by the king who would crush his enemies. Idols will be gone through the king who will be born, and it'll happen not merely through his political conquests, but also through his removal of idolatrous practices. And so in verses 10 to 15, we read about the purification of the place by the work of the Lord Jehovah. And if you look at this carefully, you'll notice the decisive language as God says, I frequently throughout the passage. So it says, and notice all the I language here. It says, it shall be in that day, says the Lord, that I will cut off your horses from your midst and destroy your chariots. I will cut off the cities of your land and throw down on your strongholds. I will cut off sorceries from your hand and you shall have no soothsayers. Your carved images I will also cut off and your sacred pillars from your midst. You shall no more worship the work of your hands. I will pluck your wooden images from your midst. Thus I will destroy your cities. And I will execute vengeance in anger and fury on the nations that have not heard. And so the language of horses, chariots, and cities refers to the military strength that Israel relied on instead of trusting in God. And our modern equivalent might be defense forces, financial security, or political alliance with powerful nations. On a personal level, this might be careers, wealth, networks, or success. And no matter the kinds of new objects we might trust, the problem might actually be the same, that we trust the things of this world to give us the kind of hope that can be found only in God. And instead of worshiping God in the Lord Jesus Christ, we tend to adore the things that we make and create. We adore and even praise and worship the things that we make and God detests that practice. And then God promises to destroy sorceries, carved images, and sacred pillars, and they all represent religious practices. These were the things that people were, people were worshiping at the time instead of worshiping the true God who was their Redeemer. You know, a passage like Isaiah 44 describes this practice vividly when it says, a man cuts down a tree, then he makes it into a god, and he falls down before it and worships it. Listen to it again. A man makes a carved image out of the tree that he cut down, and he bows down before it and worships it. That's the pattern of life that's being pointed out here, and that's something that God will destroy once the king comes again in glory. So, in Micah chapter 5, as well as in Revelation 19, God gives us a vision of Jesus returning as an idol-crushing king. When he comes again in glory, he will not only expose the fragile powers of politics, but also the emptiness of false religions. And as the Apostle John writes in his book, in righteousness Jesus will come, and when he comes, he will judge and make war. 
He will come in glory on a white horse, and he will expose the empty powers of this present world, and he will destroy them with his might, and in so doing, guide his people back to God by cutting away uh, or cutting down uh, the forces of the devil. Jesus will execute justice and bring judgment in pr protecting his people. And as we believe that to be true, and as we believe that to be certain, then just like the faithful servants in the Old Testament period, we also have to look forward to the coming of our King and live our lives now in the present moment accordingly in light of that promise. And so, as we come to the end today, I know that it was not an easy passage or chapter to go through, but as we come to the end today, let us give our praises to God, holding nothing in reserve. Our King Jesus, though born in Bethlehem's humble earth, is far greater than his place of birth. This is the hope we embrace, the promise of his marvelous grace. Let us offer him our undivided hearts, and from his word, let us never depart. Trust in his sovereignty, for Jesus rules with justice and mercy. Follow his commands, for his words are more than demands. And resist the temptations that seek to draw you away from God. And stand firm in the faith that Jesus has given himself to you through his gospel and through his spirit. May we serve him with our might, walking in truth, shining in light. May we live for the glory of our King for a world that longs to sing. Let us rise with the gospel, bringing salvation to the nations, and may God, so strong and true, guide us home and carry us to eternity. May God bless you and keep you, and may the Lord protect you through his grace, and may God bless you to the extent that you may be surprised by his wisdom and power. And may that amazement continue and continue throughout all eternity as you marvel at his grace and praise his greatness. Amen. Let's pray. Our gracious Father, we thank you for this morning where we could, we could gather together in this place to listen to your word read and to, explain, uh, to understand the meaning of your word. Father, we pray that you would increase our faith and deepen our trust in the promise concerning the coming of our king. And just like the people back then had to trust the coming of this king, help us also to put our trust in Jesus, who will come for sure, just as he came about 2,000 years ago. Help us to live in righteousness. Help us to seek you as we fight your enemies, the forces of Satan. And help us to rely on your strength, not our own strength, as we uh, progress in our pilgrimage and look forward to our eternal home. So, Father, bless us, protect us, and work in our hearts that we may worship you forever. And please bless our souls, especially today, as we remember your grace. So, Father, we thank you, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.